are welcome to the podcast. I am joined with Mark Solms and and Dr. Gosai. I am uh, really excited to have you guys listen to this. This um, interview will go through some of the basics of Mark Solms' book, The Hidden Spring, A Journey to the Source of Consciousness. Neither are all of us uh, are conflict of interest free. Uh, we do not accept any money from pharmaceutical companies. We are bringing you this, um, hopefully for your expansion of your conceptualization of consciousness, emotion, drives, how we should diagnose. Um, as we progress in this uh, talk, we, we get to kind of where psychotherapy kind of interacts with consciousness and some of the historical underpinnings of things. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I'd, 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 I'd kind of like to think about Mark Solms coming into this session, kind of like Tom Cruise came into Oprah Winfrey that one time where like the excitement level was so high that Tom Cruise started like jumping up and down on the couch, right? So I would like to say that like, it's, it's a delight to bring in, you know, a child psychiatrist who's deeply in love with your work. And of course, I've enjoyed uh, hearing you speak. I've been to, uh, you know, a conference where you've spoken and also your book is, is, is amazing. So it's good to have you on. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So um, I thought we'd start since since your book is on consciousness. Um, can you describe kind of like a, an elevator pitch for what you think consciousness is and where it is located in the brain? Well, uh, when you say what I think consciousness is, that's part of the problem is that it doesn't seem as if anybody can agree on what that word refers to. So I, uh, the best we can do is be explicit about what we mean, what one, one, one oneself means by the term. I, I, mean what the philosophers Tom Nagel uh, and David Chalmers uh, are referring to when they say that there is something it is like to be an organism that has consciousness. So the, the experiential qualitative, uh, there the, the, the is something it's like to be that thing. It's not just a blank existence. Uh, there's, there's a qualitative phenomenal feel to it. And I put it that way partly because that seems to be about um, the, uh, the the closest we're going to get to a consensual definition of what we mean by consciousness. We mean, you know, those things are conscious that that possess this quality of something it is like to be themness. Um, but also because it's a kind of deflationary definition. In other words, it's a it's a it's it's not claiming too much. It's 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 speaking about the, the most elementary form of what we mean by consciousness, which is just experience of any kind. Um, so, so that's what I mean by consciousness. And uh, my uh, the elevator pitch uh, that you're asking for <laughs> boils down to two points. You know, the one is that um, I think we've been looking in the wrong place uh, when we've been trying to identify what they call the neural correlates of consciousness. In other words, this qualitative uh, feeling of, of being an organism, which part of the brain's activity correlates with that sentient being, we, we've, we've conventionally looked to the cortex. I mean, for more than 100 years, well over 100 years, we've looked to the cortex as being this neural correlate. Uh, and I think that's the wrong place. I think we should be looking to the brain stem, in particular to what's... Uh, known as the loosely known as the reticular activating system of the upper brain stem, the basic arousal structures of the brain. There are all sorts of reasons why we have not looked there in the past, but there, there are all sorts of reasons why we should be looking there in the future. And then secondly and lastly, uh, uh, the, what's, what's novel about my approach is that I think that the foundational form, the elemental form, the basic form of consciousness is not this stuff that we are looking at right now. In other words, visual or other extraceptive perceptual consciousness, 
a visual consciousness has been our model example of what we mean by consciousness. I don't mean that we've ever reduced consciousness to vision, but the basic strategy seems to have been, if we can understand how visual consciousness arises, we can we can extrapolate from there to the whole of consciousness. I think that, uh, that uh, we should be focusing on affect, in other words, on raw feeling, feelings like hunger and thirst and, and, and fear uh, and sleepiness, uh, that these are the most basic forms of consciousness. And if you want to understand what it is, uh, then you should start with its most basic form. So, so there's my pitch uh, in a few sentences. Would you say, um, I feel, therefore I am? Absolutely. I would say, I feel, therefore I think, uh, therefore I am. Okay. And specifically, your definition of feelings would be the conscious awareness of um, like emotion, right? And also, you extend it to things like thirst and some of these more bodily desires is that is that how you would frame it yes i don't mean to imply uh, for a moment that something like thirst or other bodily affects are the totality of consciousness i mean of course consciousness uh, consists in a lot more than those sorts of basic bodily feelings uh, what I'm claiming is that those basic bodily feelings are the elemental form, the foundational form of consciousness. And what I mean by that uh, is that probably it's the, it was the first uh, type of consciousness to emerge evolutionarily. Um, but I also mean it in the functional hierarchical sense that in our brains here and now, uh, all of the other... Um, complicated forms of consciousness, including uniquely human forms of consciousness, all of that stuff is dependent upon uh, that raw affective feel. So unless you have those, those basic affects, uh, those, the, the basic feeling state of being an organism that's registering its own states, unless you have that, all of the rest of it uh, is not possible. So the rest of our consciousness is contingent upon that basic affective awareness of bodily existence in the world. How important was, um, I know in the book, you kind of tease apart the, the kind of the differentiation between, you know, this quality of kind of consciousness and historically in terms of, you know, from what we see in the medical world and psychiatry and um, different aspects of like arousal, you know, whether it's like delirium or whether it's, um, you know, using the Glasgow coma scale. How important was that for you to kind of just, because a lot of the times, you know, when we're talking about affect and, and feelings and, and consciousness, it, it becomes a semantic um, battle uh, between the kind of the professions. And so do you want us to speak a bit about um, just how important was to kind of tease that uh, apart for you? Yes, it, it's very important. Thank you. Uh, it was in the late 1940s that uh, Magoon and Maruzzi, two American neurophysiologists, discovered to their absolute surprise, it's not as if they were expecting to find anything of the sort, uh, they discovered in the late 1940s that the reticular activating system, uh, this is a deep uh, core brainstem set of nuclei, uh, that, that, that they generate consciousness in the sense that uh, I just mentioned a moment ago, that all of these cortical higher forms of consciousness um, just can't exist without brainstem arousal. Uh, and, and this led to the surprising uh, finding, not only that consciousness is endogenously generated, in other words, it doesn't flow in through the senses, it comes from the inside uh, outwards and upwards, uh, from the inside of the brain outwards towards the extra receptive uh, mechanisms of the brain. Um, uh, not only that, but also that it's a very ancient thing because uh, those brainstem arousal structures have been with us for over 500 million years. They, they, are, they are shared by all vertebrates. So th that was the surprise. And the way that Magoon and Maruzzi dealt with that surprise uh, introduced the, the notion that you've just uh, uh, alluded to, 
uh, namely that there is such a thing as blank arousal, that there's a kind of contentless uh, 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 quantitative dimension called the level of consciousness, um, which we can uh, uh, divorce from, uh, differentiate from uh, the qualitative contents of consciousness, which they then uh, persevered in claiming was what cortex provided. So they, 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 upon realizing that the cortex cannot generate anything conscious unless it's activated by the brain stem, they effectively said the brain stem is like a sort of power supply for a television set. And unless you plug your television set in the wall, of course, it's not going to be able to do its televisual thing. But that doesn't mean that the power source is really where it's at when it comes to television. That was the kind of image that they used. And, uh, and with that came the idea, you mentioned the Glasgow Coma Scale there, the, the idea of measuring the level uh, of consciousness as a kind of quantitative dimension. The Glasgow Coma Scale is a 15-point scale, and you sort of locate the patient uh, uh, on, on, on that quantitative uh, uh, dimension of wakefulness. Um, then contents and qualities are added by the cortex, which, which creates the theoretical fiction, and I really use this word advisedly, the theoretical fiction, that there is such a thing as blank wakefulness, you know, that you can, that you can be conscious without there being any phenomenal experience. But nobody's ever pointed to such a thing. Nobody has empirically ever demonstrated what blank wakefulness looks like. Um, and uh, if you take, this is the crucial empirical point that I'm making, because really this is not semantic. Uh, I'm saying there is no such thing uh, as brainstem arousal that has no content and quality. Um, and so the, the, the critical test is to take patients who have only an intact brainstem uh, and have no cortex. Uh, and I'm referring here, I know you well uh, aware of these cases, the children born with a condition called hydranencephaly, uh, where they either have no cortex or no forebrain as a whole, um, but certainly no cortex, uh, and they have a fully intact brainstem. Now, the theory that I've just mentioned, the one that, that, that inherits from Magoon and Maruzzi, and which is still the mainstream view in the whole of behavioral neurology, the whole of neurocognitive neuroscience, that this is the mainstream view, that the brainstem is just a power supply. It's got no content and quality. If that were correct, then these children are a critical test of the theory. They should be in a coma. Uh, or uh, more precisely, they should, they should have blank wakefulness, um, what, what is called the uh, vegetative state, which is also defined as non-responsive wakefulness. Um, but when you look at these kids uh, and crucially interact with them, uh, they are, first of all, certainly not in a coma. They go to sleep at night. They wake up in the morning. They lose consciousness when they have seizures, uh, which sadly they're, they're prone to. Uh, but much more interestingly and much more importantly, not only theoretically, but also, frankly, ethically, um, they are anything but non-responsive. They are emotionally responsive beings. Uh, they show the full range of basic uh, emotional responses, and they show them in situationally appropriate ways. In other words, they get frustrated when you when you deprive of them of something that they want. Uh, they, they get a fright if you if you surprise them. They, they, they giggle if you tickle them, you know, and so on. So uh, they, they are, I mean, that's the essence of, of responsiveness, uh, that the, they are emotionally responsive and, and, and also, very interestingly, they show emotional initiative. They actually try to bring about uh, 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 situations uh, which, which they like. So the critical test of what you expect to find, uh, in, uh, if the cortical theory of consciousness were correct, that, they, that, they're, that the contents and qualities of consciousness are entirely uh, attributable to cortex, then children who have no cortex and never have had any cortex should have no content and quality. And yet, uh, you know, this is what we find. Now, I must tell you, I'm sorry, I'm probably babbling on too long, but it's such a fundamental point. My colleagues uh, still, many, of, I mean, many of my colleagues uh, still make, they say, well, how do you know 
uh, that those children are conscious. Um, because, of course, they can't speak. They've got no cortex. Uh, and this seems to be the gold standard, reportability. Uh, if you can't report your conscious states, uh, then, you know, there's this, this is sort of inexplicable skepticism as to whether or not they really are conscious. And of course, the same applies to preverbal infants. Uh, on that criterion, preverbal infants are, are automata, you know, and, and, and so is your dog and your cat, you know, not conscious because it can't say, hi there, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling happy. Uh, so, so, you know, we've, there's lots of other evidence we've, we've gathered in, to try and get around that objection. But I'm just uh, trying to answer uh, this fundamental point that you've made, you know, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, how are we to understand this distinction between the level and the contents of consciousness? And I think, to come back to my starting point, I think it's a fiction. I think there is no such thing as a level of consciousness, a blank, contentless, qualitativeless consciousness, because consciousness is there is something it is like to be conscious i've never seen any conscious creature that i don't know what you could possibly mean by a conscious creature that there is not something it is like to to experience its consciousness okay here's here's um is here's a follow-up then for that is consciousness a spectrum or is it like an on or off like spectrum meaning like as someone goes into for example a hypoactive delirium or a delirium and they become progressively um, less conscious of their reality, right? And more like reactive. Um, or, you know, as someone becomes more in inebriated with alcohol uh, or fine wine, uh, I, I understand you have a, um, you, you, you have a, a winery. Um, you know, do, do people, is, is consciousness like a step is there steps down in consciousness in your perspective or is it like a linear on and off? Like, how do you see that? I think that question has two aspects to it. Um, and so let me address them in turn. The easy part of it uh, is, you know, are there more and less uh, complex varieties of consciousness? And I would say, yes, absolutely. Uh, 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 for example, I have little, um, I have little hesitation uh, in ex acknowledging, in fact, gratefully acknowledging that we human beings uh, have a degree of reflective consciousness, uh, of awareness of our awareness, uh, and, and, and ability to abstract ourselves from uh, our first person perspective and see ourselves from the from the third person point of view and so on. Um, you know, there's no doubt uh, that that is something way beyond what I'm attributing to these hydran and cephalic kids, there's no possibility that they could have that sort of experience because they have not, not only no prefrontal cortex, but no cortex at all. So uh, th th that is the highest form of consciousness, you know, uh, uh, and, and then there are, there, are, there are all sorts of degrees going downwards, not only in terms of uh, a, a species specific levels of complexity, but also um, also pathological forms. So you refer to delirium, which is a kind of disorganized form of consciousness. Um, and you refer to uh, uh, inebriation, which is a sort of obtunded consciousness. And, you know, of course, those are degraded forms. And, and, and clinically, you know, the, the Glasgow Coma Scale that we were talking about earlier, you know, it quantifies or, or it, it, it sort of very roughly locates you on the scale of how much consciousness is present. Uh, although I hasten to add the point I made earlier to repeat it, that the how much doesn't mean only a, a, a volume control. It also means how much consciousness, in, in other words, is there a qualitative a, a something it is like to be uh, uh, in that state. In, in its most rudimentary form, it is just feeling. It's just, you know, without any, like in other words, feeling hunger uh, or feeling pain. It's just a feeling. You don't have to have a name for it. You don't have to have any theory about where it comes from, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's internal or external, or, you know, all of those things are just a raw, simple, uh, valenced uh, feeling is, 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 is enough to, to my mind uh, to, to, uh, to, to attribute consciousness if that is present. 
But the second meaning of your question, you know, on or off, um, is a is a little bit more difficult to to uh, to answer. Uh, you know, I I, I would say uh, clearly there can't have been a moment um, where uh, until that moment there was no consciousness in the universe, and then on Wednesday, you know, the thirteenth of August, uh, 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 five hundred. Uh, million BCE, uh, uh, you know, consciousness dawned. I think that there there must be precursors. There must be sort of proto uh, proto consciousness, uh, and it becomes very difficult to 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 clarify what exactly one means by that. I, I'm happy to do that, but it's more difficult, is what I'm saying. So I think that there is a kind of a grey area where it becomes questionable whether this you know, shall, should we attribute the word consciousness to this. Or to that, or to that, and I think that that's a bit of a mug's game. You know, there's, there is no absolutely sharp demarcation. Uh, that's that's the second part of your question. But the first part, which I think is the main thing you were getting at, absolutely, there are grades of consciousness, um, and uh, the, 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 that's 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 clearly true. Um, I, I think, uh, to be clear, that the mistake we've made in consciousness studies is to focus our attention on the most complex grades of consciousness. Um, and, you know, looking at these higher corticals, is, is sometimes specifically human forms of visual perception, uh, and thinking that this is the appropriate place to start. Why? Well, because we know we are conscious, so let's start with us. But, uh, you know, I think that um, the that's that's placing a little bit too much emphasis on the problem of other minds, because it's very unlikely that consciousness begins with us. And so I think it just makes simple scientific sense to start with its more basic forms, if you're wanting to understand what it is, how it works, what it's there for, and so on. Is it fair to say, um, and a follow-up question to that is like, is it fair to say that that, that kind of that triangle, those, kind of the, those brainstem structures uh, with the reticular activating system and, and a couple of others, um, instead of it being more like an on and off switch, uh, a power supply, it's more like a, they're, they're, they're modulating. There's a chapter in the book where it talks about the source where it, it isn't just this source of kind of like this power supply, this this uh, downward to the kind of neocortex kind of uh, impression it kind of gives and, and functioning. There is a, there's also feedback um, from the neocortex to the reticular activating system. And so it works more like um it seems like it works more like modulating stuff and obviously like a instead of like a fountain of consciousness it works like a an estuary of consciousness there's a mix in it it's probably not the the best name for a follow-up book or something but um is that is that am i am i on the right track uh, seeing it like that it, there is this uh, there is this interplay uh in those kind of brainstem structures yes so um let me answer your question, uh, and then I want to say something else, which I think is an important uh, uh, elaboration from what you've just said. So to, to answer your question, yes, absolutely. In the normal brain, um, the reticular activating system, which is what we've been talking about until now, um, it, it, its, its role is to modulate um, the activity of other brain structures, most importantly for present purposes, to modulate the um, the arousal uh, of uh, of cortical uh, uh, message passing, so the cortex is an intrinsically unconscious instrument. Uh, it's perfectly capable of doing its basic cognitive and perceptual tasks unconsciously. There's tons of evidence for unconscious perception and cognition, including uniquely cortical perception and cognition. So the cortex doesn't have to be conscious in order to function. Uh, but when it becomes conscious, it's modulated by reticular activating system. And then, as you say, uh, then there's also feedback um, to the brainstem, uh, most importantly uh, to the periaqueductal gray, um, PAG for short. Um, and the PAG, together with the reticular activating uh, system, uh, 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 is, a, is a kind of functional unit for arousal. Uh, 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 upward and downward uh, uh, sort of circular motion uh, of, of, of arousal. 
then there are other structures in the brainstem, particularly the superior colliculi and, and the midbrain locomotor region, which are also important in terms of that triangle you're referring to. But the crucial point you are making is it doesn't function by itself, does it, is what you're asking me. You're saying it's, it's, a, it's modulating the function of the cortex. And I would say, yep, absolutely, that's true. Um, but um, I would add uh, that the, that system exists uh, in creatures that do not have cortex. Um, so we must, we must also wonder, well, what does it do prior to the evolution of cortex? Um, and this is an empirical question also, you know, we can, we can, we can investigate hypotheses, uh, we can make testable predictions as to, uh, you know, is there evidence to suggest that these creatures with no cortex, but only with reticular activating system and the other brain step machinery we're talking about, uh, is there evidence to suggest that they're conscious, notwithstanding absence of cortex? And, and also, uh, as it happens, the children we were talking about a moment ago, you know, they have no cortex. So uh, my point is twofold. Yes, normally in us, uh, in us uh, uh, creatures endowed with cortex, and uh, normally we, 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 we speak of the function of the reticular activating system in relation to its modulatory function uh, at, at the level of cortex. And that's, that's what it does with us. But I'm saying that that is not the basic ingredient of feeling. That's already stage two. Stage one is just, if I may translate it into words, which the creature is not capable of. I feel like this. It's just feeling. Uh, then stage two is, I feel like this about that, to extend conscious feeling onto its sources uh, so, so that you can monitor not only how you're feeling, but also what's causing those feelings and, and what effects uh, or changes in my context, having upon my feelings, to have a common currency uh, between uh, these extraceptive representations and my, my, my endogenous feeling state uh, is an advance over the most basic form, which is just how I feel. Uh, and you don't have to represent consciously um, the, the, the context. I said that there's evidence that such a thing exists. I'll just mention one. I mean, apart from the kids who I've already mentioned, um, in zebrafish, uh, who have the brainstem machinery we're talking about, but no cortex, uh, we we put them in a. I say we. This is not an experiment of mine, uh, but uh, we neuroscientists testing the hypothesis uh, that these fish have feeling states uh, made the made the falsifiable prediction that if you place substances in their tank, uh, in the fish tank, which have no nutritional benefit, uh, but which have which have hedonic, uh, uh, in other words, they feel good, uh, substances like nicotine, morphine, amphetamine, cocaine, which are actually bad for the little fish, uh, but which feel very good. But the prediction was that they will show condition place preference behavior. They'll stay on the side of the tank where those substances are being um, are being delivered, and the, the the prediction is confirmed. The the fish like to hang out where the cocaine is, uh, and the other three substances I mentioned. So you know this suggests that raw feeling uh, 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 it affects the behavior of a creature that has no cortex. Uh, and 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 I'm, I'm emphasizing the word feeling there because that's all that these substances do is that they feel good. And uh, so I'm saying that feeling in and of itself um, does not require its modulatory function on cortex. I said I want to add something to my answer. So that's my answer to your question. Yeah, normally yeah. there's this loop, but this, that loop is a second order of things. The, the first and foremost, the brainstem just feels. The secondly comes the stuff we're talking about. Now, what when I said there's feedback uh, to uh, the uh, periaqueductal gray. It's important to add that that feedback doesn't come only from cortex. In fact, it comes it comes from all of the homeostatic, um, uh, the, the, the we complex creatures. In fact, just about all creatures. In fact, all creatures uh, we have needs. Uh, we have to remain within certain physiologically viable or biologically viable bounds, and uh, deviations from those bounds. Uh, are demands on the organism to do something, otherwise it's going to expire. 
and uh, and then it and then it performs some work to bring itself back within its homeostatically viable bounds. And the the feedback from all of those homeostatic mechanisms, the sort of error signals, the sort of uh, how am I doing in terms of my biological viability? All of those signals descend. Up, I mean, all of those signals descend upon the periaqueductal brain. Um, and so, and and there's no structure in the brain, um, which in humans uh, we we know this from humans because they can declare it. Uh, there's no structure in the brain which produces more intense affects and a greater variety of affects when stimulated than periaqueductal gray. It's the most concentrated feeling generating tissue that there is. Um, and, and it's where all of these homeostatic uh, error uh, signals descend, uh, congregate. Um, and so the, my hypothesis, uh, to come back to you know, the implicit question, or something implied by your question, is consciousness not in its raw basic form a modulation of cortex? I'm saying, no, there's something more basic, which is that it is a, it is a, a registering of how well or badly you're doing in terms of remaining within your homeostatic bounds. Um, we we uh, all, as I said, all living things function homeostatically. That's what differentiates us from non-living things is that we are working to remain, to, to, we are resisting entropy. We are resisting the second law of thermodynamics. We're not dissipating. We're staying within our expected phenotypically viable states. And um, the, so I'm saying that is that the basic mechanism of consciousness is the, 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 uh, I mean, not, when I say all creatures function homeostatically, I, I mean all living things, I mean even plants. So I'm not saying that all of them are conscious. Uh, I'm saying that there's something added to homeostasis. All the evidence suggests it's something to do with the homeostatic error signals. Uh, that's, that's what affect is, is all about. And affect, in my view, in other words, the, the dawn of consciousness, the first elementary form of consciousness in the, in, in the, a, a, a raw feeling sense of the word uh, is the additional capacity, not only for homeostasis, but for the organism to register how well or badly it's doing here and now. Did that work or did that not work, what I did now? Uh, to be able to register, uh, you know, errors, uh, not only in, by dying, uh, but by feeling bad, which predicts death. It means you're heading the wrong direction. Uh, and, and, and pleasurable feelings tell you you're heading in the right direction, uh, that this is an enormous adaptive advantage, and it enables uh, creatures so endowed to navigate uncertain environments, un environments which are not predicted by uh, their phenotypic, reflexive, and instinctual uh, 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 capacities. So, that such a creature doesn't only survive as long as what it does automatically works. Um, if what it does automatically doesn't work, then it's got this sort of additional uh, 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 level of, of, of uh, functionality, which is, okay, that didn't work, now what about this? Let's try this. Um, and feeling uh, registers uh, in, this, in this valenced qualitative form, how well or badly you're doing in terms of uh, meeting your homeostatic imperatives. That, that is my, my hypothesis. Okay, so, um, gosh, there's a lot of questions I could ask, but one, one I was thinking about was that I read that you were psychoanalyzed for n nine years, five times a week. And my curi my, I'm curious of what, what would you say your observations were of your own ability to be conscious of your emotions, experiences, feelings, um, reasons for doing things before and after that experience. Yeah. Well, um, let me say just quickly why I, why I went to the trouble of being psychoanalyzed. It was uh, because I was so frustrated as a, as a neuropsychologist, with the emphasis on the psychologist part of it, you know, I thought that neuropsychology would be about neural mechanisms of mental life. Uh, but you know, the, mental life surely first and foremost is subjective experience. Uh, and uh, when I trained in the early 80s, subjective experience was still a swear word. You know, so if you asked your professors about 
yeah, yeah, but why does it feel like something uh, uh, to to uh, um, to uh, retrieve a memory, or why are we consciously aware of the uh, wavelength of light that we're registering? Why can't we do that unconsciously? You know, they're sort of politely advised you not to ask questions like that. That these are not you know proper scientific questions. They're bad for your career. So I was so dismayed at the neglect of subjectivity. Uh, in, in, in behavioral neuroscience. It's, it's very behavioral. It's like what yeah. we can physically so that's see. Why I, th okay. That's why I turned to psychoanalysis. I, you know, I thought, well, for all of its faults, you know, and let's be frank, uh, psychoanalysis has lots of problems. At least it foregrounds subjective lived life uh, of experience as, as the stuff that it's studying. So, so I just wanted to preface my answer uh, by clarifying that's why I, I, I went to those lengths. Um, okay. The, okay. The so, main... so before we, that's interesting no. too, because we're talking about there's got to be a problem of homeostasis that leads to us becoming consciously aware to make action, right? So, what would be to make voluntary action? To make voluntary action. So, your the problem what that you saw was um, a, a dissatisfaction with the intellectual knowledge that you were learning. This is a very advanced <laughs> consciousness awareness, right? Which led to you like seeking behavior, right? So seeking, uh, venturing out of the normal tribe of behavioralists um, to venture into kind of uncharted territory. Is that? Yeah, yeah. A, it was. A, is that a fair because, description? Th that's correct, and it's because. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't want to make it seem as if I'm some kind of uh, conquistador or something like some kind of hero. Uh, it was why I was interested in the field. You know, I, I, I was interested, as I said a few minutes ago, in how can, how does it happen that that I, my subjective being in the world, is also a bodily organ, and how do these two things relate to each other? And I thought that's what I'd signed up for, studying that. Uh, okay. And when I discovered no. It wasn't only, I must say, it wasn't, uh, this was the early 80s. So it was, uh, I mean, the shadow of behaviorism was still, you know, very much uh, falling on my field. But 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 it was after the cognitive revolution. It was a decade after the cognitive revolution. So we were allowed to speak about what's going on inside the black box. You know, uh, it wasn't just um, stimuli and responses. It wasn't just behavior. Uh, it was also what is what kind of processing is going on inside the uh, between the ears you know that generates that behavior but that processing was all construed in uh, sort of third person uh, information processing terms there was no question as to as to the subjectivity the subjective quality uh, of mental life it, well, that was okay. still an embarrassment to 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 our science and i think you can't have i mean to have a neuropsychology uh, in which you exclude the subjective is, is, is basically, it, it's like an oxymoron. How can you have a neuropsychology that excludes the psyche? I and mean, what is the psyche if not first and foremost you know, experiential? So, so, so that, was, that was the problem that, that I faced. And, and that's why I, 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 I trained in psychoanalysis because I wanted to bring uh, those, because, because they had been studying subjectivity. They had a whole, and still have, a whole conceptual armamentarium. You know, of that they have words and theories that 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 uh, pass this part of reality. You know, uh, what is a self? What is what do we what 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 do we mean by feelings? How do how, how do well, how many basic kinds of feelings are there? How do they relate to the the organismic needs? And you know, and and in what way do they motivate us? And you know, and all of the dynamics, the interactions between feelings and cognitions. That, that, that's what that discipline is all about. So I wanted to bring uh, all of that uh, theoretical yield of a century of psychoanalysis into neuroscience. And that's what I've done. I mean, I'm, and I don't regret it for a moment. I think it was a good idea. Um, but you, you were asking me about my own experience of being a, uh, in psychoanalysis. Yeah. And, you know, I could obviously go on for a long time about that. But the crucial thing was, first of all, it made me aware in the most direct, uh, immediate, personal way, how much of my uh, cognitive life is unconscious? 
you know, and, and I know that we now know that in cognitive neuroscience, in fact, more or less at the time that I started to train in psychoanalysis, cognitive neuroscience, the 80s and the 90s caught up with that, you know, that uh, the vast bulk of our cognition uh, uh, carries on unconsciously. And, you know, I experienced that directly. That's probably anybody who, 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 who submits themselves to a psychoanalysis has the 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 the, the experience um, the shock of realizing my god you know that's why i did all of these things mm. uh, i mean like i'll just give you a, a very apt example i didn't know that the reason i became a neuropsychologist it sounds ridiculous when i tell you this my brother my older brother suffered a brain injury uh, when when we were little uh, and he was radically changed as a person and it it really destroyed him, if, 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 if that's not too strong a word, his life. It's certainly, it, it's the single worst thing that ever happened to him and perhaps to my family as a whole. So I directly, personally uh, uh, witnessed, you know, how, who you are um, is, is somehow bound up with your brain. Uh, and my brother changed from one, you know, before his accident mm -hmm. and after his accident, he was literally two different people. So it's clear that that's why I became a, a neuropsychologist. And I'll tell you more, it was that I felt bad every time I did well at school. It was mm -hmm. like showing up my brother who, who couldn't manage school. Uh, and so my, my, my desire to do well, my own ambition, uh, you know, uh, the only way I could do well academically was in a way that, that didn't hurt my brother or, mm -hmm. or for that matter, my, my parents, uh, you know, all of us having to having so the, the 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 motivation to become a neuropsychologist was was not only i'm interested in how brain and mind relate but also i can do well in that field and help people like my brother so it's not so bad to do well in that field mm. you know you don't have to feel guilty for it. so these are complicated thoughts um and yet none of it was conscious so in my analysis i discover shit obviously yes that's why not only why I'm uh, you know, in this field, but why I've taken the particular approach, because you can see also why it wasn't just about cognition. You know, I wanted the, 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 the I ended up doing many things which are really frowned upon uh, by my colleagues, and not only training in psychoanalysis, but also I was interested in therapeutic work with my neurological uh, patients. Uh, you know, to be a therapist, as opposed to a bench scientist, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of like slightly lower class of activity. The therapists, they, they get their hands dirty. But, you know, I really wanted to do that and needed to do that. So these are the sorts of things that I personally learned uh, from my own analysis. But if I may add one further thought, not thought, uh, observation, is that anybody who submits themselves to psychoanalysis learns not only what I've just said, but in addition, uh, they learn that they are motivated by feelings. We, nothing matters more uh, in the life of the mind, in the way that we live our lives, uh, the decisions we make, the, we rationalize them as we may, uh, you know, actually in the end, it's all about feelings. And uh, so uh, I learned that too. Uh, and it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a shock. It's quite a, a humbling, a humiliating actually in many respects also experience mm. to realize that actually that's all it comes down to you know this is what our lives are about so those two facts um that that most of our cognition is unconscious uh, and that what's really driving the show uh, is, is, is 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 emotional feelings uh, th those are the things that uh, i think were the most important lessons uh, I, I i learned by submitting myself to analysis yeah. Do you think, um, do you think you're feeling, you became more conscious of your feelings, like in your day to day sort of interactions in the process? Yeah. Yeah. Now this is a very complicated topic. I mean, what does one mean by becoming more conscious of one's feelings? I, I, I think that, um, feelings by definition are felt. Uh, I think if you don't feel a feeling, it's not a feeling. So, I mean, it's literally an oxymoron to say, you know, that you have an unconscious feeling. I well, think that we use that phrase very loosely. What we really mean um, is something like, you know, that, that
that we're acting on the basis of our feelings without connecting our actions with the feelings. So we have feelings and then we do stuff and we don't realize that it's because of these feelings that I'm doing this stuff. And it's you know, not just behaviors. I mean, also all sorts of thought processes. And, you know. um, yeah. but, well, but I also think it's got to do with our ability to articulate, uh, to name, to, to differentiate, you know, so you mentioned earlier that I, I for my sins, uh, uh, I, I, I live on a wine estate, and I really mean for my sins, because the, the, that's in South Africa, there are lots of sins behind land ownership in South Africa, but that's another story. But, you know, you mentioned wine, that if you drink a glass of wine without knowing a bloody thing about wine, you know, you taste, tastes like wine, or tastes like some sort of like bitter grape juice, or I don't know what, you know, and then as you learn more, so you, you, you differentiate, you know, you're able to actually register, uh, you know, the, the mouthfeel and the nose and the, you know, uh, and the body and the, and the complexity and etc. And you can identify that's a Shiraz and this is a, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon, they got nothing in common with each other. But only if you've learned how to, dip. so I think the same applies to emotions that all of those qualities are there in the glass. Uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a naive uh, uh, adolescent, uh, let's hope an adolescent having your first glass of wine, uh, you're not going to have the same experience as you are if you're a connoisseur 20 years later. Uh, I think that we can draw a direct analogy uh, with, with feeling, but it doesn't mean that those qualities were not there. It just means you couldn't name them, identify them, differentiate them. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So give you kind of like a little bit more nuance in my thoughts on that. So I'd be curious how you would fit in the core emotions, for example, that Darwin and Paul Ekman wrote about the micro expressions. So these like very like one tenth of a second, one thirtieth of a second flash of emotion, which I actually train people on how to use that in psychotherapy, um, emotionconnection.com. And what, what I've seen is that someone will flash an emotion. For example, let's say that if they have OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So they'll flash an emotion and then they'll have anxiety about the emotion. Um, maybe classically called like sing signal anxiety. And then they have a defense. And so you, you watch the emotion flash on their face. You watch the defense, which in case of like OCPD will be like intellectualization or rationalization. And their intellectualization, rationalization are very far from the emotion. And it can be even a denial of having the emotion, right? Or you'll get someone um, who has like a hypomanic defense, like to a negative emotion. So then they go all positive and then they, um, or a hypomanic spiritual defense. So it's like they, they add in, twist in some spiritual content into that sort of very positive emotion instead of feeling that negative emotion. So when I say to you, did you become more aware of your, um, what you were feeling? You know, I imagine before, I mean, before I did psychoanalysis and was analyzed, like I wasn't, I was more intellectualizing things that were probably more present, but not felt in the way because it, it induced shame to feel them or guilt. Um, or maybe you, maybe you feel differently about emotions. And I'd like to hear if you, if you disagree with any of those points or if you see I it differently. That, no, I don't, I don't disagree with any of them. Um, I think that um, perhaps the most important point to make before I speak a little bit more about defense mechanisms, which is what you're talking about fundamentally, uh, the most important point to make is that um, when I use the word feeling, uh, I'm referring to something you feel. Uh, and uh, if you don't feel it, uh, then it isn't a feeling. And that's not just a semantic point. It's a, it's a functional point. It means that there are things that you can do. Uh, remember I spoke earlier about the adaptive advantage of feeling. Uh, the, uh, the same, I don't only mean it in the evolutionary sense, I mean it also in, in, for each and every one of us. Uh, if, you, uh, if you feel something, uh, then you, you possess it. Uh, you, you, and I said that it enables you to make choices, in other words, to, to, to have voluntary behavior as opposed to merely automatized responses. That is the crucial functionality that feeling allows. It allows you to feel 
what the consequences of your actions are and to change your mind accordingly. If you do not have that feeling, then you function automatically. And this is in the realm of a lot of psychopathology, uh, that patients do things, they know not why, um, and that ends in tears every time. Uh, and uh, they do it again. Um, so the a crucial feature, and that by the sound of what you're saying uh, with, in your own work too, a crucial feature of what we're trying to achieve uh, in psychotherapeutic work um, in, in, in psychiatry is to, is to bring something to the level of feeling so that the patient is able to have choice over how they live their lives rather than to uh, be compulsively, uh, automatically driven to, to do things without them being aware, not only that they're doing them, but that they're also not the best thing to do because you know, it, it always ends, ends badly. So th th that's the first point I wanted to make, which is that it makes a difference whether you feel something or not. And that, that, that thing called a feeling uh, is what I'm studying. And I want to know how in the brain is that generated? What does it do? Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and what are the fundamental laws governing it, etc. That's what my work, my most over the last while, uh, th that's what's most interested me. Um, but then to come to the matter of defenses, yeah, certainly, uh, I agree that there are things that we do in order to avoid uh, feeling things, which um, c comes at a cost. In other words, you know, if I can take the most, the most um, simple sort of example, um, if I were a spider phobic, you know, then every time I go uh, towards where the spiders are, I feel terrified anxiety. And so I avoid those places in the world where there might be spiders. Um, th that restricts my life. I now can't go where spiders are. It doesn't mean that when I'm, when I'm in non-spidery territory, I have unconscious repressed spider fear. I, I, I'm, I'm avoiding that place in order not to feel the fear. So now I'm not having a feeling, but it comes at, at it comes with consequences. So that's a very simple way. I mean, you internalize that there's a place in your mind where you have fearful thoughts. You avoid that place in your mind. Um, it doesn't have to be in the outside world. That's what we mean by a defense mechanism, that there's certain places you won't go. In other words, there's certain things that you know that you pretend you don't know, um, but they're still there. And so, you know, it comes at a cost to the way that we live our lives and, and more restricted, more stereotyped, you know, and, and less aware uh, uh, you know, of our optionality, crucially, um, you know, is, 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 is what the price is. So, yes, certainly I agree there are defenses against feeling, um, and, and that's not the same thing as an unconscious feeling. Um, it is behaving in, 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 in restrictive ways uh, in order to avoid experiences which you can't tolerate, but it comes at a cost. Okay, but, but what you just described is like, you, you see the spider, you feel the fear, you're aware of the fear, and then you, def you, you, cre you, you have psychological defense that pop up. Do you think that it's possible to have an emotion, not be aware of the emotion, have a defense against the emotion, deny the emotion ever existed? I think what happens, so, you know, we're beginning to become a little Talmudic here, but I understand why it's important. Um, I, I think that certainly there are, like you gave the example of, of, of a micro emotion, like a momentary reaction uh, by the patient, uh, a, a facial expression of a particular emotional response, and then uh, they do something else uh, and, and, and uh, they don't seem to be aware that momentarily that uh, they they were there was behavioral evidence that they were disgusted or fearful or whatever the case may be um the uh, we have analogous situations in sleep science you know we speak of awakenings uh, which is when the person is awake and they say hello uh, and then we have uh, arousals uh, which are brief awakenings and then we have micro arousals which are very brief awakenings and physiologically you can show uh, the, the brain has woken up, uh, mm. but the person has no recollection that they were awake. And then it's, there's this Talmudic thing, as I say, you know, do you say that they were awake or do you say that they weren't awake? Well, it goes back to the question earlier about, you know, the, the, the gray area between no consciousness and consciousness. 
I think the same you know, applies in a non-problematical way to to feeling. You know, it's like you know, the, there's a, there's a point at which one becomes aware I'm scared, uh, and and there's a point before that where it's such a brief registration of the scared state that the person doesn't even re but they respond to it. You know, um, just as you see on the EEG in the sleep uh, uh, studies, you know, you see that this that the, 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 the it's not only that they're aroused in terms of the EEG, it's also there's a change in their muscle tone, there's a change in everything, you know, so they, they physiologically woke up very, very briefly, and, you know, and then they went back to sleep. So that happens. Um, I think that's one variety of what you're talking about. Somebody's fleetingly in an affective state, and then they've got their whole, um, they've got their whole um, defensive operation that they then uh, uh, rapidly uh, put into motion. And that that protects them from having to remain in that state for long enough to even register that they're in that state. Um, and I said to you that has all those consequences, which is why I'm, I claim again, I emphasize again, it's important to be able to feel what you're feeling. Um, it, it's it's a it's mm -hmm. a it's a good thing right. to be able to feel what you're feeling. But I want to add one quick thing, sorry, which is that it's not always like that. Uh, once you've had the experience um, of um, if I go there, uh, to use again the silly uh, example of, of a spider, spider phobia, if I go there, I see a spider, so you know I, I, I run. Uh, then in future, I don't go there. That, that second uh, phase, I think, happens in our patients all the time. So they, they don't have to have the momentary feeling. They, they, they have only the defense uh, so that they never expose themselves to the negative affect and you 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 can say well that's unconscious emotion uh, it's that they have learned a way of dealing with emotional situations which enables them to avoid having those emotional situations so they don't even fleetingly have to have them at all but crucially that learning is the product of feeling so feeling still drives it it's still driven by what i call the law of affect um you know but you can have all kinds of stereotyped, unconscious ways of thinking and behaving, uh, which, 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 which then uh, take on a life of their own, and, and you no longer have to have any felt uh, affect uh, accompanying them. Okay. And oh, I, I just had a quick. We have some time for another question, right? Well, um, basically, I understand. Like, obviously, the the podcast is called psychiatry and psychoanalysis. I just, I'm trying to. Um, come at it like come at it like if I was like a third year or fourth year kind of medical student or just starting my, my residency and so I really like the fact that the, the book itself um you're kind of taking things that we I think I think I googled it I think we're still learning about defense mechanisms when we're doing our board exams like the, the step one board exams uh for medicine right and then it seems as though Unless you have a, you know, unless you have like a supervisor who is an analyst, uh, an, an analyst, or or you go to a, a residency that is is that way inclined, it kind of kind of drops off, and that was kind of a little bit about my experience, especially the later on in my my career. Um, that where does Freud kind of land for you, just in terms of that that you you do a great job bridging. Um, Freud to Pangsep to obviously another paradigm shift to Friston. Like, so what would you tell, uh, you know, a medical student learning about defense mechanisms or even uh, part of a psychiatry residency, you know, learning about Freud? Like, how does this really link into you know, how we see our patients? And, and, and is this something that we can use in a more formal um, day to day kind of manner, which, which I obviously do, I've I mentioned before? Yeah. I, I think that uh, it's an unfortunate uh, situation when it comes to Freud. And I, I don't know who's to blame for it, well, whether it's the Freudians or the anti-Freudians, perhaps they're both to blame for it. You know, that, it, that it's, um, we can't seem to uh, treat Freud as the pioneer uh, of a discipline, uh, like Darwin is the pioneer of, evolutionary biology and everything that goes under that banner, like molecular, you know, genetics, uh, Darwin had absolutely no inkling, uh, I mean, even of the structure of DNA, he didn't even know the laws of inheritance, you know, he knew nothing about, I mean, genetics literally didn't exist. Uh, we don't say, 
uh, well, therefore, we mustn't teach Darwin, you know. But but by the same token, you know, we can't teach Darwin as if he were the be-all and end-all of evolutionary biology. Likewise, Newton in physics, we don't, we don't, uh, 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 you know, attack Newton as uh, some kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a terribly damaging figure in the history of physics because he didn't recognize the quantum nature of the universe, you know. Uh, we teach Newtonian physics and uh, then we go on, move on, and then we teach everything else. And it's not about a sort of hagiography about Newton the man or, you know, or, or, or Darwin the hero. So that's why I say I'm not sure who's to blame. But, you know, clearly what Freud sketched out is a Freud tried to bring the subjective experience, the lived life of the mind, part of nature, he tried to bring it into natural science. But of course, he was the first one to do that. And so, you know, he only had the most rough and ready initial sort of sketch, uh, leaving out a hell of a lot that he didn't even realize existed and getting some basic things wrong. What, what, what else do you expect? But he was an absolute pioneer of a very important branch of science, uh, this, the science of what it is like to be um, and what can we learn about being, uh, in other words, about, about uh, the... The the, 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 the the living uh, organism in, in, in the case of psychoanalysis particularly the, the human organism what can we learn about how it works by studying it from the perspective of what it's like to be one you know that there's certain things you can observe from the subjective perspective not least of the feelings you know that you can't observe any other way and so you, you won't know what impact uh, these things have on the organism if you don't take them into account. And so I think psychoanalysis is a terribly important part of the mental sciences, terribly important, terribly important part of psychiatry, terribly important part of neuropsychology, but it's just part, you know? And uh, so so that's what I would say. I would say any, any psychiatry program that leaves that area out, uh, you know, the serious study of, the, of, of, of what it is like to be a patient, the role of the feelings, what are they for, what do they mean, why, you know, and how does the patient's behavior relate to their subjective state, and everything that we've learned, the most obvious facts about how the way that you behave uh, relates to your developmental emotional history, you know, all of those things, if to have a psychiatry program that doesn't have those things center stage um, is, is, is just, you know, it's just appalling. It's just appalling to have a psychiatry that is only about neurotransmitters and, and receptor types, you know, is is uh, a tragedy. But uh, but at the same time, to have a, a psychiatry that's just about teaching Freud the whole Freud and nothing but the Freud, as it was in the early decades of the 20th century, you know, it's equally appalling. So I, I hope that's a, not too obvious an answer, but that's certainly what I feel. Yeah, it's hard. Um it's hard to imagine what it was like in Freud's age when he was doing this because we don't have that viewpoint of like what it was like to be a patient back then or like there, you know, there was no treatment like therapy, like what would it be like without that? Um, I sometimes think about that or like, you know, just historically, if you were ill, you would end up, in an asylum of sorts and some of them were very horrific um you know induced vomiting bloodletting uh you know chains at times so into that world you you, ha you have to like read freud and think about like okay he's trying this out patient one patient two patient three you know um yeah, I don't know. Any other thoughts on the? And that's like... what I mean by a pioneer. I mean, you know, what you, you mentioning things going all the way back to the Middle Ages, but you know, there were in psychiatry in the in the late nineteenth century, it was little more than quackery. You know, hydrotherapy and electrotherapy and rest cures and you know, going into the mountains. And, you know, it's like uh, compared to that and what Freud introduced, the, the idea. You know, I don't need to tell you what the talking, the basic ideas behind the talking cure, which we now absolutely take for granted. You know, psychotherapy is an enormous advance, and and all of the the insights that lie behind that, all forms, almost all forms of psychotherapy derive from 
you know, those observations that Freud and Breuer and, you know, and, and those pioneers of psychoanalysis made. And we owe them, a, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a massive leap forward uh, for, for medicine and, and, and for, uh, you know, and for mental health care. Um, I, I, you know, I, I just, I, I just think that's, that's so obviously true. And uh, I, 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 I don't know why it's so hard for, for people to see that, you know, it's, uh, I wrote a paper in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2018, at, at the international edition, uh, uh, the title of which was The Scientific Standing of Psychoanalysis, uh, where I tried to uh, address that, these things directly for a psychiatric audience, sort of saying, look, let, let's just, you know, let, let's just uh, not lose sight of the wood for the trees here. This is what psychoanalysis is about. This is why it's important. This is what it claims. How can we deny that? And isn't that important? And, and I was very pleased to receive a little certificate from Cambridge University Press at the end of that year saying it was the most highly cited paper of the year. So oh, wow. it seems somebody in psychiatry is still listening uh, yeah. if, 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 um, if we address it uh, in a kind of sensible, sober, scientific way. Yeah. For, for me personally, it was like, I think I was maybe not totally disillusioned, but, you know, you know, the, I was in a world where it was very kind of DSM centric, but that, um, when that, I think I, I grabbed you on kind of YouTube, but then I kind of read um, your paper on the conscious id, when you kind of flip things around, that for me, that was like a, a game changer in terms of, and maybe it was like, I was, um, I didn't want to waste all those, all those kind of years, like you know, looking up Freud and kind of studying it. It was like I needed to make it practical, and what you did was made me feel as if that wasn't a waste. It wasn't looking at kind of tea leaves, as it were. Um, I and I don't know, you know, not to minimize that, but it just it was it was very very profound, and it seems is that is that how you felt with that shift, and that kind of then kind of uh, connects to uh, you know the rest of the book, as it were. Yeah, so that was uh, that paper uh, uh, that you're referring to. I published that in 2013, and that really was a turning point in my own scientific thinking. Um, when you introduced me uh, earlier, David, you said that I was the discoverer of the four brain mechanisms of dreaming, uh, oh. and 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 that um, that that uh, phrase is crept into my bio. Because when I did that work, which was in the 1990s and early 2000s, I was wanting to emphasize, you know, that dreaming is driven by four brain mechanisms. Um, it was that pivotal uh, moment that you're referring to 2013 was when I realized, hang on a minute, you know, there's, there are things going on in the brainstem which are fundamental to the life of the mind. And uh, so that, that was shifting down to these much more primitive mechanisms. And, and crucially recognizing that this is the that these that these brain regions are where consciousness has its source, um, and the, the 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 major revolution in my own thinking there was for Freud the id, in other words the drives, uh, these fundamental demands made upon the mind uh, uh, to, to to perform work by virtue of the, we, us being embodied. Um, the, the drives for Freud were unconscious, that his id was unconscious. And uh, as I understood those brainstem mechanisms, which are the mechanisms of drive, um, you know, they, they perform exactly the work that Freud was referring to, the, the demands made upon the mind for work by virtue of our embodied uh, nature. Um, th th those mechanisms are brainstem mechanisms. And, uh, and the mechanisms in question are the ones that give rise to the most fundamental form of consciousness, namely affects, made me have to uh, recognize that actually uh, drives are felt. Uh, that, to use a silly example, we're constantly burning up glucose. You know, with, we have a need for energy supplies. And so in our adipose tissues, there are these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, what, what nutrients are stored and we burn them up. But we don't call that a drive. We, we don't call that hunger. It's only when you feel hungry that you're driven to seek food. That's what we mean by a drive. And so uh, as simple as it may sound uh, to, to our audience, that for me was like a major 
revelation that you only a drive only has has the qualities of of a of a motivational force once you feel it, um, and that when we speak of demands made upon the mind for work, those demands are felt. Um, so that was, you know, and I was expecting because you know, psychoanalysts are extremely conservative. Uh, you know, it's not it's not. Uh, you, you don't expect to be welcomed with open arms when you say the id is conscious. <laughs> uh, but that's what mm. I had to say in that paper. And happily, it has been for the most part, uh, for the most part, very well received. How do you, um, I want to make sure we touch on your relationship and um, kind of your thoughts that Yank Panksept came up with. Uh, he was an Estonian American neuroscientist, psychobiologist who authored a book, Affective Neuroscience. And in it, um, and you kind of talk about this quite a bit, actually, and it sounds like you had a friendship with him. Um, he was a part of your group. Uh, and so he talked about seven biologically inherited primary affective systems. Um, seeking, fear, lust, care, panic, grief, and play. How did, how did his work shift your view on, you know, neuropsychiatry, neuropsychoanalysis? Well, yeah, so Jörg Panksepp was a, 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 a very dear friend of mine and uh, probably uh, my closest scientific collaborator uh, I mean, in the, over my scientific lifetime, I think I have collaborated uh, uh, more closely with him than with anyone else for a sustained period of time. Uh, sadly, he died five years ago, but uh, uh, his, his work had a profound uh, influence on me. Uh, you speak of his seven uh, emotional drives. Um, I, I want to emphasize that those are not the totality of our drives. Those are what we, we, we loosely call the emotional ones. I say loosely because, again, who's to draw the dividing line? You know, is lust a bodily or an emotional feeling? Uh, is disgust a bodily or an emotional feeling? Uh, but but Panksepp draws the line somewhere and says, well, these seven, uh, for which there's really solid evidence that these drives certainly exist in the mammalian brain, the human brain included, um, let's call those emotional ones. And then, you know, hunger, thirst, sleepiness, and the need to defecate and so on. Uh, those are not emotional. So the seven emotional ones, uh, just looking at those. Well, first of all, it is uh, from the psychoanalytic point of view, an enormous uh, advance. Again, I, I said uh, that we had to recognize that Freud was wrong to say that the id and its drives are unconscious. Uh, likewise, we have to recognize that Freud was wrong to think that there are two uh, emotional drives, as he always did. Uh, although tentatively, he always said, well, biology will eventually decide the question. Uh, and to, so to say there are seven rather than two is a big step uh, in psychoanalysis. And I, and, and I don't only mean a big step uh, because it means Freud was wrong. I mean, if there are seven emotional drives at work in the life of the mind, uh, this has massive clinical implications to recognize those forces at work in our patients. But you used the word neuropsychiatry, and so I would like to uh, uh, add to what I've just said about the implications, the importance, uh, the relevance for the clinical practice of psychoanalysis. The, the same applies to, to biological psychiatry. Uh, I, I think that uh, with all of our um, frustrations with the DSM uh, uh, approach, uh, everybody, even the authors of the DSM are saying this is not the way to go. They, they, they're groping for uh, a, a, a more viable, uh, a more biologically um, uh, you know, grounded uh, uh, basis for um, carving up the uh, carving up the, the, the mind at its, at its joints. You know? and, and I think that this is the these um, endophenotypes, as they're called, you know, these natural kinds of emotional motivation and emotional feeling uh, and emotional chemistry, let us not forget, when we speak about the development of psychopharmacological agents, which seems to have ground to a sorry halt uh, recently, 
Uh, here is an opportunity uh, for grounding psychiatry uh, on the basis of natural kinds uh, of emotion, uh, which certainly have very direct uh, manifestations in psychopathology, these natural kinds of emotion. They're recognizing them enables us to recognize uh, uh, things about psychopathological uh, uh, conditions that we hadn't previously seen. And, and also, as I said, uh, it's a bridge between um, the subjective experience of our patients and the, the, um, the, the neurochemistry of what's going on. And, 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 and therefore, also, uh, there, there, there are all sorts of opportunities there for, for drug development. So I think the, that Panxip's oh. work is crucially important for the future of psychiatry. And do you do you personally use like that? You know, a lot of times, you know, you're, the things that you kind of uh, um, are talking about, like I just see it as like extra frameworks, really very intuitive frameworks. But you know, using do you use this these kind of primary effective systems when you look at patients? For me personally, like uh, I, you know, uh, I'm I'm always prescribing wrestling to. I work with kids, so you know, mums whether they're, you know, a family system that's been disrupted by divorce or whatever, you know, I'm like saying, you know, do you do you do rough and tumble with your kids? And then, oh, no, that's, uh, you know, that's dad does that sometimes, or maybe they do a baseball. Um, but the fact that the work that I read from Hangsep in terms of the, the role that play um, is so intrinsic to brain development, ADHD, um, diagnosis is I, I just it's 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 profound to me. So do you, I don't know. Do you use that as well? Yeah. So that's an example when I say that it's not just important uh, to recognize uh, the 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 much more viable taxonomy of the drives that Panxip has introduced over the one that Freud uh, adhered to. It's not only important for historical reasons, but also for for, for practical reasons, uh, you, you've you've alluded to an outstanding example. You know, the people just don't think uh, that there's that, that never occurs to them that there's a need, a drive to play. That we mammals need to play, and if, you know, it's just as much as we as we need to stay safe. Uh, you know, just as much as uh, we need to be able to get rid of frustrating uh, uh, obstacles. Uh, if you can't do that, you know, in, in the long run, you're not going to survive. Certainly, you're not going to survive emotionally. Uh, you know, if you can't defend your place in the sun, uh, and and play uh, is a need, a drive, uh, every bit as biologically uh, necessary uh, for our well-being as all of the other ones. And uh, and Panksep, uh, you know, saw that, and to bring that into psychotherapy, child psychoanalysis. Uh, uh, and psychoanalysis generally, because it's not only children that need to play. Uh, we all need to play. But to add, yep. we're using the word play colloquially here. You know, it's a, it's just a word for the very, uh, <coughs> very complicated, uh, uh, you know, a, a thing uh, w w w w properly scientifically described. But you ask, do I take these? Do I use these things in my clinical work? Absolutely, I do, and I have done ever since. That that fateful paper in 2013, uh, and and I've and I've progressively been doing so more and more, and over the last uh, well uh, since just about the beginning of lockdown, so you know perhaps three three years or so, I've been I've been um, running, uh, I have clinical seminar groups um, all over the in in, in many major cities uh, now online of course that's why I say since since the beginning of lockdown. Where, where, where I and groups of colleagues uh, in the in these various cities, uh, we have an ongoing clinical. We, we have various ongoing clinical seminars where that's the whole point of those seminars is that uh, members of the group in in rotation present their cases, ordinary psychotherapy and psychoanalysis cases, uh, and we discuss them directly in relation to. Uh, the, the Panksepian drive theory. What light does this cast in our understanding of what's going on here? Uh, what feeling is this patient suffering from? How do we how do we classify that feeling within the within the Panksepian taxonomy? So that's an emotional need that's not being met. And now let's ask ourselves why. How is the patient going about dealing with that need? Because clearly the way they're going about dealing with it isn't working. Otherwise they wouldn't suffer that feeling, which is 
a homeostatic, a negative affect means you're not where you need to be. And so we then look at the transference in the broadest sense of the word. I, I don't believe transference just means what the patient does with the therapist or the analyst. Transference is what the patient does with their present day object relationships. Uh, it, it's transferring from primary object relationships to present day object relationships. So we look to the transfer. How is the patient going about meeting that need? What do they do? Um, and it, it really, it, it is of very direct, concrete clinical relevance. Uh, and, 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 and I find it extremely useful um, to think about. I know you're saying more than that. You're also saying, well, then what is it? What are the implications for what we do? It has direct implications for yeah. what we do, as, as, as you know. So, yes, I, I think it's a, some, something of a quiet revolution uh, going on, uh, uh, just beginning to go on uh, uh, in, in exactly this area that we're speaking about. The importance of PANCSEPs, uh, uh, understanding of the multiplicity of emotional drives uh, and, and, uh, and, and what exactly are those uh, basic categories of emotional motivation uh, and the implications of all of that for our clinical work, both in psychotherapy and, I, I say again, also uh, in psychiatry uh, generally and, 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 and mm -hmm. even in psychopharmacology. I think that it's, it's, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important uh, uh, new paradigm for, for, for all of those fields. For me, as well as, as, uh, as the importance of that, it's like when I'm talking to my, my, my patients, parents, uh, it kind of normalizes things. When, when a kid is dysregulated and upset, raging uh, against, uh, you know, get, getting their iPad turned off uh, five minutes before bedtime, you know, the parent is like, you know, they must have ODD or bipolar disorder. What, you know, it's kind of very DSM centric. And it's kind of like, no, they are having normal mammalian feelings I know you describe it very, very well, just in terms of rage, um, you know, something, you know, my mom is get, getting in the way of me playing my computer games and I'm having this normal feeling, but then how do we get through that? As, and obviously things get in the way, ADHD, autism, you know, the, the kid is like, a, you know, a child. Um, it just makes me, I, I'm able to talk to um, the parents without being so pathological. Your child is having a normal mammalian feeling. We just gotta yeah. go figure out uh, how, to, how to deal with it. And, and, and I feel, I think the parents really value that, um, I feel. Uh, yeah, uh, everything you've just said, I, I agree with. And that's, and it tallies with my own experience. Rather than this pernicious thing, which has been around for a long time, you know, if I may say so, forgive me, perhaps particularly in American psychiatry, you know, <laughs> your kids got this, you know, it's uh, as opposed to a kind of an explanation of that means something, you know, this is why your child's doing that. And I don't mean it in the kind of hocus pocus, you know, it means something, there's some symbol. I mean, just, you know, feelings are there for a reason. Uh, they, they can be understood. Uh, if your child's, you know, behaving in this way uh, and displaying that kind of emotion, it's because something's causing that. So, you know, let's have a look. And, and, and it's uh, because it's in a biological framework, which kind of fits with the zeitgeist of the general public, educated public, uh, perhaps in particular, you know, they, they, don't, they, they, they want to hear things that sound, uh, you know, scientifically, biologically plausible. And so, you know, this is uh, the great uh, uh, value also, in just in terms of public relations, you know, that you could convey... Yeah. Uh, 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 really pretty uh, uh, psychodynamic things in a in in a way that that is entirely comprehensible and palatable to you know to to to, to anybody. It's kind of commonsensical, uh, and 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 we really need that corrective because because the tendency has been this other one of you know uh, your child's got this, and it's like. Uh, 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 and by the way, all you need to do is take that, and you know, yeah. then it will then it will be better. Uh, 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 and a, a very important part of this uh, paradigm, and I want to emphasize this, is that psychopharmacological agents, for the most, for the very great most part, uh, are symptomatic treatments. So uh, it's it's you know, if you want a causal therapy, uh, you know, then you need to get to the level of well, understanding why is the child behaving like that, rather than just 
you know, quashing the feeling. You need to know what the feeling is there for. What does it mean? What does it tell us about what's going on? So I, I, I think that for all of those reasons, it's terribly important that we move in this direction. And, and luckily, as I said earlier, it seems as if you know, pretty nearly everybody recognizes that our current way of thinking is not really working. Um, so, I mean, in Britain, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists is beginning to rethink their neuroscience curriculum. And uh, I'm part of a group of people who are, who are trying very hard to get exactly what we are talking about. In other words, affective neuroscience to be the core of the neuroscientific curriculum for the training of psychiatrists in Britain. I think to start and practically end uh, with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, receptors uh, and, and molecules and, and is just far too mm. far removed from the, the, the real level of the kinds of variables that actually uh, govern uh, from, a, from a neuroscientific point of view, uh, govern the kinds of things that psychiatrists are dealing with. So let's hope that we'll make progress on that front. Well, if you want to make progress with my audience, we can we can have you back and do a deep dive on those seven. And I, I actually like, I think this is like what gets me excited. Um, I'm, I'm, you're in good company. Um, you know, I, I teach the, uh, the psychiatry residence psychotherapy. I've been doing that with, um, my mentor, Dr. Tar, who's like a 90 plus year old psychoanalyst. And, um, he's very big on Yak Pank, Panks up. So he like back when I was a resident, he like got me the book, you know? Um, and so for me, it's like, I was raised in a nice department where that was kind of like something we looked at. We looked at. Um, we talked about emotion, subjectivity, inner subjectivity. Um, the, you know, the cloud of unknowing was a book I read, which talked about like how different psychoanalysts maybe ventured into their particular interests due to their own developmental subjectivity, which, which is true for you as well, which is nice and true for me as well, of course. Um, and so I think this has been a delight to talk about. And I'm just, I almost feel like an hour and a half has brought us to like just the tip of the iceberg. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like just feeling like all these, this, got all these questions. <laughs> the, like we've, we've like, we've, we haven't, there's so much we could get to. Um, but I, yeah, before we kind of wrap things up and I want to, you know, honor your time as well. Um, are there any things that you would like to sort of put out there? to, you know, my group of therapists and psychiatrists who listen to this and budding future therapists and psychiatrists? Um, no, I'm, well, perhaps if there's one, um, I mean, first of all, let me say, I agree with you, we've only scratched the surface and uh, I'd be very happy to come back for a follow-up uh, uh, discussion with, with you guys. I've enjoyed this very much. Um, if there's anything that uh, your audience could do in the interim, uh, perhaps they could read a paper which is uh, freely available online uh, that I published in, um, I think it's Frontiers of Human Neuroscience, it's called, um, the journal. Uh, the, but in any event, the paper is uh, 2018. Uh, it's called The Neurobiological Underpinnings of Psychoanalytic Theory and Therapy. The neurobiological underpinnings of psychoanalytic theory and therapy. If you just Google neurobiological underpinnings and my name, uh, the paper will come up. Uh, I think that that's a, a good kind we'll of put it uh, in the show notes. summary of uh, of this the the, the the way I'm thinking uh, about these issues, um, and uh, and it also provides the in the references, you know, something of the literature upon which it's all based. So people who want to read that would be a good starting point into the literature, good entry point. And and I would also recommend definitely get Mark Solm's book, The Hidden Spring, A Journey to the Source of Consciousness. Um, we will also link some YouTubes and different audio lectures we found online, which, which we think are helpful. And for my audience, um, I think they'll, I think they'll enjoy this content. It's, it's the, the book is, it's rich. It's, um, it's not something that's like, 
like a, a you know a thrilling novel that you you know it's like more meaty it's like every sentence you're like oh gosh i need to digest that um so it was it's, it's a good book and my audience i think will really enjoy that 